An old map of Glenorchy shows how the roads were different. The Brooker Highway opened in 1954, and as it extended further north, it would come to slice parts of the town in two. Bowen Road was one of the busiest streets on the island. Today, cut in half, it has been relegated. At the far end, it has been discarded, pinched off like a lizard-bitten tail. It still looks alive from a distance, but up close, it is necrotic. So back down there, you can see a truck turning onto Derwent Park Road. That's where all the traffic goes now. There's no traffic on Bowen Road, this section. It's a dead end street in the sense that the end of the street is dead. This is what all the roads in Glenorchy and Hobart would look like if they were left. If people suddenly disappeared by magic after a decade or so, all the roads would look like this. The water gets into the road and it separates the road. The surface goes apart, then seeds get into the cracks and then you get plant life coming up and then those roots push the road even further apart. You don't need heavy traffic to destroy roads. If you just leave everything, nature will take its course. So this once really quite busy part of town is now reduced to a ruin. It's maybe the best ruined road in southern Tasmania. There's not only roads, but also paths and bridges that have been forgotten. Such things can be found on Humphrey's Rivulet. Coming down this abandoned bike track, you might find that some poor sod has left their bike behind. So the dog and I have come about as far as we can walking down the rivulet. You can see where the bridge used to be crossing from this side to the other and back again. There could be, there should be people walking their dogs and exercising, going for a jog, pushing their prams up and down the rivulet in Glenorchy. It's as nice as the rivulet that is more famously in South Hobart, but it doesn't have the amenities, so nobody's able to enjoy it. What is here, what's left of what was here, is in such a state of disrepair that I suspect that almost nobody knows it even exists. It's not in people's minds. But all of this, however, could, of course, be very different. Chigwell, as a locality, was gazetted in 1956. Originally made up of public housing, much of that stock has since been sold privately. The word chigger which also means bogan, is derived from the area. As with other parts of the capital, it is still a place where a person might rediscover their car after it has been borrowed for a few hours. Among the newer stuff, there is an older thing, now known as the Chigwell Barn, a rare surviving example of a substantial mid-Victorian farm building constructed from sandstone rubble. Records show that the barn belonged to Thomas Lowe's and it was part of his 500 acre property in the 1840s. Some less than sympathetic additions have been made to it. The large embrasure that is now bricked up from the inside would have been used for ventilation rather than the firing of arrowheads.
This stream that's running under the bridge here is Faulkner's Rivulet. It's one of the many creeks that runs down through Greater Glenorchy. This bridge is historically interesting. It has significance, yet there's no plaque about declaring what it is. There's no signage saying what it was used for. If this very old bridge was in one of the many other parts of Greater Hobart, it would have those things. It doesn't. It's kind of like what Hobart was 50 years ago when there weren't signs up everywhere declaring to tourists and to just the local citizens what things were. So in a sense, maybe it's more interesting that it's left like this. There's trash everywhere and there's graffiti on the stonework. Maybe somehow that's a bit more enigmatic. It's just here. Eventually, maybe someone will put a sign up. The name of the stone culvert is Lowe's Bridge, built also by Thomas Lowe's, but making it one of the oldest bridges in Tasmania. Ad hoc attempts to protect it have been made, and over the decades, repairs have been performed. It seems that there is no suggestion on the early maps of any accompanying roads or tracks. It was most likely used for moving livestock across the private property, but we don't know. So up there you've got the main road of Glenorchy and over there's the Brooker Highway. But this here, this feels strange. It feels like there's something wrong. You wouldn't go as far as to say there was something wrong, but this used to be where the main road was until everything was realigned in 1926. So when you come here, there's this feeling. And if you've ever driven past, you've probably had your eye drawn to this spot and not really understood why. The Undine Hotel was only licensed for a short period in the 1890s, but the building dates back at least till 1838. It was built on the then main route from Hobart to Launceston. Today, that part of the main road has been reduced to a cul-de-sac. In the 1920s, the main road was realigned when a bridge was erected to cross the train tracks. Today, that train line carries no carriage. The Brooker Highway has also isolated the spot further, hemmed in on both sides in ways unimaginable to the original builders. Urban evolution occurring unpredictably. The Berrydale Inn was put up in 1833 on the road from Hobart to New Norfolk. In the 1840s, stag hunts took off and ended here. Later, they held competitive ploughing and then wood chopping in the grounds. It also seems that they held shooting competitions using live birds as targets. The pub became contemporary but finally closed in 1972. It's the oldest surviving former pub in Glenorchy. Napoleon on St Helena by Benjamin Robert Hayden depicts the exiled emperor after complete defeat. Longwood was the name of his residence from 1815 until his death in 1821. Folklore has it that Lowe's Toft was built around 1850 as a replica of Napoleon's final home. Built by Thomas Lowe's, today the place is a vineyard. Near the old main road, by the shoreline, there is a small memorial. Dogs were first used by Australia as soldiers in World War I. They were probably used to their fullest extent in the Vietnam War. The animals were airlifted by a helicopter using special harnesses and dropped deep into the jungle. Once on the ground, they were put on the scent of the retreating enemy. Following at pace, they would stop with nose and paw extended at point facing the suspected hideout. They were used this way from 1967 until 1971. None of the dogs returned to Australia. 
because the Australian Army did not want to cover the costs of quarantining them. The animals were instead given to European and Australian families living in Saigon. The fate of the animals, from this point onwards, is generally unknown.